I hear the dripping again, the constant drip, drip, drip of water. I blink my eyes open and try to focus to make sure I'm not in another nightmare. It sounds like another leak. This one might be the last. The last time I will hear it before the horrible conclusion to this ordeal. The last time hearing that telltale noise before the true nature of that loathsome portal is revealed and whatever hideous dimension hiding on the other side breaks through completely. The sound is growing louder, each drop has an exaggerated tone. It sounds like small explosions all trying to collapse the ceiling and engulf me in the dark abyss that I have already once been forced to endure. I just can't believe this could really be happening, it just can't. It swallowed people up, the portal behind that damn leak. I don't know what to do. Just a short while ago, my only problem would have been the water damage to my belongings. Indeed, such a mundane problem as a leak in the ceiling would just be a minor issue. Nothing to fear except the repair bill. Yet I'm afraid it is a bit beyond that now. I shouldn't have waited this long, I should have just left. Yet where could I have gone? Maybe I should have paid more attention to who I was talking to and what they were saying. All too late now, I suppose. I have been living in this apartment for close to six months. I had moved into this dingy complex to a small studio apartment after I lost my job and had to find a part-time position at significantly less pay. I tried to stay optimistic but even before the terrible reality of what I was stepping into was clear, I was still on hard times. I could barely afford this decrepit room as it was and I had no family or friends to speak of that I might be able to move in with so my options were essentially non-existent. Considering the dire situation, I found the cheapest accommodation I could, and what I found was my home in hell for the last six months, number 316 at the Greenfield Heights apartment complex. The amenities included paper-thin walls to hear all the drug deals gone wrong, domestic violence, and constant sirens of emergency vehicles blaring from all sorts of incidents, topped off with a nice turned-down service of package and mail theft to boot. All of these problems, though, feel small compared to the true horror of what the place had in store for me. No, it wasn't exactly a paradise, but I had to find the cheapest place I could. I was barely making a fraction of what I was before at my old job, and I needed somewhere to get back on my feet. I told myself it was temporary and once I could get a better job, I would get out of here. When I had first arrived to look at the place, I had arranged a simple walkthrough with the landlord Mr. Jacobs, a very unpleasant fellow who always looked perpetually angry and was constantly shouting in the halls and at the few miserable looking staff who worked here. We walked up two flights of stairs passing a wall of profanity laden graffiti tagged along almost the whole length of it, leading up to where my future home was to be. Mr. Jacobs opened the door and the rattling handle nearly fell off in the effort. We stepped inside, and the dank room stank like a tomb. The tiny apartment was depressing, and when he went to turn on the main light, nothing happened. He scoffed and muttered a string of colorful language and grumbled that, someone will bring a new light bulb. I told Rodney to check earlier that lazy piece of shit. I didn't want to press the matter since he looked pissed off, so we went in, and he showed me what little there was to see of the tiny apartment. We had to rely on the dim light of the bedroom to see elsewhere since the main light was out. Despite leading the walkthrough, it looked like Mr. Jacobs was distracted. He was looking at the ceiling in the corner of the tiny living room with a concerning grimace on his face. He stared at it for a while and paused the tour. I found it a little weird. He finally looked back at me as if noticing that I was watching him stare at the ceiling and he shrugged and asserted that. You are going to want to get some buckets, when it rains heavily that part of the ceiling leaks. Can't seem to find out how, since there's no leak on 416 above, but bad luck on this one. I guess that's the only reason the price is so low. He shot me a grin that I could only describe as enthusiastically malicious. After the brief walkthrough, Mr. Jacobs turned around and asked very bluntly, you're not a troublemaker, are you? His eyes narrowed and he looked very threatening suddenly. I assured him of my earnest intent and need for a place to stay, and he softened briefly. At least I think he did. It was hard to tell with him. He regarded me one more time and said, 
Good, we don't need more troublemakers. Too many questions, always snooping around. If you have any questions, try to figure it out yourself. This isn't the Ritz we don't take care of everything for you. You are going to have to make do as is. Something really bad like a fire, then you can call. But for minor shit, best to just figure it out yourself. Rent's due on the first, by the way. No exceptions and no grace period. Anyone who bums out on their debt gets their asses kicked out next day. Fuck tenant laws. He shot me another wicked smile and returned downstairs leaving me with the keys and just assuming I had agreed to move in. I was dumbfounded by the combination of his upfront hateful attitude and the subtext of certain things he had mentioned. What in his mind was a troublemaker, and what happened to those who asked too many questions? I couldn't believe I was going to have to live here. In a better position I would have left immediately but it was either here or homeless. All the other places I had looked were too expensive, so I left and began packing my things. The whole situation was awful, but I had no choice. I moved in the next weekend. Moving day was as bleak as my mood. It had been raining on and off again all day and seemed to start heavily just in time to when I was moving my boxes, almost as if to spite me. I started taking my stuff upstairs to my new room. As I was taking the first box up the stairs, I thought I heard a gunshot. I rushed on in nervous tension and as I was approaching my door, I heard a voice call out in a tone that was actually friendly. Excuse me, it looks like you dropped something. I was surprised to see a woman standing in the hall with a look of friendly concern. As I looked down to see I had indeed dropped something from the broken box I was trying to carry upstairs. Hi, I'm Maxine, I am your neighbor in 315. I introduced myself and was relieved to have found a friendly face for a change. Hey there, I'm Greg, nice to meet you. I held out my hand and she looked uncomfortable briefly and declined the handshake. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold I shouldn't, but it is nice to meet you, she said with another disarming smile. I was relieved to see someone who didn't look they were minutes away from killing me or someone else, though the paranoid part of my brain was begging the question why such a seemingly nice person was stuck here. I considered asking her but figured it would be rude to pry about her situation. She might have been like me and just on hard times. I was embarrassed when I realized I was just standing there after saying hello and stumbled for words, but she spoke first. Well, it was nice meeting you Greg. Stay safe and try not to let your spirits get down. It's easy in this place, but nothing bad lasts forever. She smiled and waved goodbye. I looked down to make sure the box was secure, and when I looked up to say goodbye, she was already gone. I wondered how she was so fast. Nevertheless, I felt slightly more hopeful that things might be okay after all. Another hour of moving boxes and my knees were on fire, but the meager possessions I had were finally stuffed haphazardly into the tiny apartment. I was dead tired, but it was only 4pm. I figured I had earned a nap though and went into the tiny closet that was supposedly a bedroom. No furniture fit besides my old mattress that took up the entirety of the space. I laid down and started drifting off. The peaceful sound of rain started to get heavier and then I heard a new sound which woke me from my doze. A tiny dripping sound coming from the main room. I remembered what Mr. Jacobs had said about heavy rain and a leak and I got up quickly to make sure the water was not landing on all my boxes and getting everything wet. I looked up in the corner of the room and sure enough, there was a steady dripping onto one of the boxes below. I poked around and found the dishes box and took out a few pieces of Tupperware and a bowl and set one underneath the leak. I thought for a moment about calling Mr. Jacobs, but then remembered how he had given up on fixing this leak and realized it would do no good. I turned around to go back to bed when I heard an odd tearing sound like wallpaper being stretched to breaking point. When I turned around, there was nothing there. I figured it was just my nerves and I went back to bed. I slept for about two hours, and despite the brief rest I had a vivid nightmare of drowning in a dark lake with no shores on any side. It was horrible, just sinking into a black watery abyss. I was embarrassed as I woke up with a scream, but relaxed as I realized it was just a dream and no one likely heard or cared that someone in 316 was screaming anyway. I figured the rain and that damn leak had got me thinking about water and my negative mood may have contributed to a nightmare, so I brushed it off and went about trying to organize the chaos of boxes in some logical manner for this small space. 
Later that night I had a cup of ramen for dinner and turned in early. I read a bit before bed, almost as if trying to postpone sleep for fear of sinking into that fathomless abyss again when I slept. Eventually I started to get comfortable and thought I may fall asleep when it started again. Drip, drip, drip. The leak had resumed, it sounded faster than before, and I thought it was strange that I could hear it so vividly. I got up to see if maybe it had overflowed or something, and I was not prepared for what I saw. The ceiling where the leak was had an odd lambent light near the center, kind of like a black light. It seemed to be pulsing in time with the drops of water. There was an odd type of density in the air too, like it was too heavy and thick. It was maddeningly humid as well despite the cold atmosphere of the room and outside. I was confused and kind of scared by the bizarre display. I just kept thinking to myself, it is only temporary. As soon as I can leave I will. I can make it through anything short term. I took a step further into the living room and noticed a wet spot on the floor. There is no way it could be all the way over here. The bowl on the floor was not even full yet. I suspected a leak might also be over in this spot now, so I looked up and screamed out loud. There was what looked like a face pressing through the ceiling with drops of water seeping from the thing's mouth. I turned to run and tripped on the wet floor and toppled over bashing my head into a wall and almost losing consciousness. I was trying to stagger to my feet after getting knocked senseless and the memory of the face reminded me of my peril. I got to my feet and looked up in tense expectation. There was nothing there. No leak, no face, no glowing shifting portal. The only evidence of anything was a small wet spot on the ceiling about 9 inches across. At that point I thought for sure that depression over my situation was causing me to go crazy and see things. I desperately wished I could be somewhere else just then. But it was late at night, and I needed sleep. I couldn't afford a hotel obviously, so I left my room and went outside to the parking lot to sleep in my car. Another week went by with poor work hours, barely any food and bad sleep. Though the one bright side was the surprisingly good weather, days went by and no odd events took place in my apartment. It was a struggle, but at least with a little sunshine there was no leak to conjure up such terrible nightmares like what I had experienced before. I ran into Maxine again on the way to the laundry room and couldn't help but ask if she knew of anything having happened in my room before I moved in, like anyone having seen anything weird or the like. She shifted uncomfortably and looked down, pausing as if not wanting to answer. I'm sorry, I don't know much, I had not been here for very long when the last person in 316 had left. I say left, but I heard there was an accident of some sort. There was a lot of commotion and I had heard some strange rantings from the man before it happened. She took a breath to steady herself after the stress of recounting the story and looked away. I was away at work when it actually happened. Apparently, he had been found dead in the apartment. Some say he killed himself, drowning. From what I heard he was a bad man, there are a lot of bad men that live here. The things that have happened that never got reported and the people that got hurt or worse, well, she looked away sorrowfully for a moment and resumed. Well, you wouldn't want to know. A coward like that would try and kill himself, but I think something akin to justice may have caught up to him, something that this place might need more of. When you live with the stain of hate and violence, it leaves something behind and perhaps sometimes the world finds a way to wash it away and right the wrongs. Anyway, I don't like to think about it. I have to run. I have to get ready for work. Sorry I couldn't help more. I hope you stay safe and stay dry. You wouldn't want to get swept up too. She turned a corner and I saw a fallen cardigan. I bent down to pick it up and it felt wet, like it had been washed already. Not too weird if she just did laundry but her footprints were soaking wet as well. I grabbed the garment and rushed round the corner shouting out, Hey, Maxine, you dropped this. But she was gone. The wet footprints randomly stopped as well. How did she stop leaving them if her feet were wet? A few more months passed with no leaks and only a few nightmares. My luck turned sour again for different reasons though. I suffered a severe back injury at work. Since it occurred while working, I got some workers comp so I wouldn't lose all my income. I did have to take time off of work, so I was forced to stay in my apartment all day and night recouping. To make matters worse it was getting into the season for spring showers and the forecast was heavy rain for the next week. 
I was not quite bedridden, but walking and bending over was very uncomfortable. I considered taking a drive somewhere, anywhere but here, but I couldn't manage the stairs again today, and I knew I at least needed to actually rest for one or two of my days off. So I was stuck in the apartment, watching the clouds gather and the skies darken. I placed several dishes under the leak spot in anticipation and I swigged some energy drinks and coffee. I would rest, but I disliked the idea of sleeping any more than I had to, since I still feared those disturbing dreams in the water. I tried to distract myself by watching some old DVDs since I had no streaming services to watch. As I started to relax around late afternoon, I was shocked back into a frenzied paranoia when the storm kicked up in intensity and knocked the power out. I tried not to panic and knew I had some candles or a flashlight or two somewhere. I would have to get up though, so I figured I would stay in the bedroom. I used my phone flashlight to find a candle and matches and hurried back to the bedroom just as the leak restarted and the drip, drip, drip was heard filling the bowls left out. I felt silly fleeing the leak like it was dangerous. I didn't know why that dream had affected me so much, but it felt wrong. I sat in the dark and waited for the power to return but it did not. I fought sleep, but even in my paranoid state I started to drift off. I was content that the door was closed at least, and it slightly muffled the sound of that constant dripping. I awoke to the sounds of running water. The drip was replaced by a torrent that almost sounded like a waterfall. I was too afraid to move but I had to see if my room was being flooded. I got up painfully and stepped down into ankle high water. Oh god, this is bad. I thought immediately as I moved to the door to see what had happened. I heard a singular splashing noise, almost like someone stepping through the water. My heart froze as I stopped just short of opening the door and focused on the sound. I heard the splashing again. It was definitely footsteps. I didn't know what to do. I tried to think who might break in. A robber. Maybe it was about the flooding. Maybe it was Mr. Jacobs after all. I grabbed the candlestick and lit the candle. If I needed to, I might be able to use it as an improvised weapon. If it could be a murder weapon and clue, then why not? I cautiously opened the door and there was a backwash of even more water on the other side. It almost knocked me off my feet. I stumbled through the door, struggling in the cold water. I knew it was impossible, but it felt like there was a current running through it, like I was standing in the mouth of a river. I finally stepped past the door and into the living room, and almost dropped the candle into the oddly surging waters. The sight before me was both amazing and terrifying. The water was moving, it was flowing into a whirlpool that was at the center of the room, but as it neared the center it inverted, and seemed to be spiraling out from the ceiling rather than the pooled water on the floor in a sight that blatantly disregarded all laws of gravity. The spectacle was so amazing I almost forgot the footsteps I had heard, and until they resumed, my gawking was broken and I saw large bursts of water splashing toward me. I heard an ear-splitting cry like the wail of a banshee, and suddenly the ceiling where the leak was coming from and the current epicenter of the vortex started to glow and after a moment it turned deep red and a new horror occurred. The face I had seen in what I had hoped was a nightmare before was back. The ceiling seemed to shimmer now, almost translucent, and I saw the horrible features of a hideous form. White, pupilless eyes stared down at me, and a gaping, screaming maw began filling with water tinged with red. No, it wasn't water, it was blood. The vortex began spewing blood all across the room, and as I turned to flee in horror, I was wrenched from my feet by the invisible force in the water and dragged kicking and screaming into the heart of the vortex. My last conscious sight that night was being pulled up into my own ceiling and into the bleeding maw of that avatar of bloody nightmare. I woke up in the black abyss. The water was still mixed with blood, but there were no creatures. I was somehow buoyant and floated along in the shore, less sanguine ocean. I drifted along unable to sink or to fully rise up. After what felt like an hour of drifting, I heard splashing and all of the sudden the sound got louder and louder. I looked around and saw the source of the noise. Bodies were falling from the sky into the bloody ocean. First a few, then dozens, then hundreds. A literal storm of blood-soaked featureless bodies came crashing into the water. I tried to evade them, but I could not dodge them all and I was buffeted by the limp forms of countless bodies until I was pummeled below the surface of the water. I couldn't breathe 
breathe, and as I tried to surface, one of the bodies grasped my wrist and opened its eyes. On its previously featureless face, it now had oddly pulsating white pupils and it burst what appeared to be stitching on its mouth in order to scream under the water. The sight and shock of that horrible scene woke me, and I realized I was laying on my back in my apartment again. The flood water was lapping at my face, and I was breathing in and choking on the water on the floor. I lurched up as soon as I regained control of my body, spitting water and gagging from the quasi-drowning I had endured. The water looked normal, no blood from what I saw, but the water itself was not a delusion or some trace of insanity it was there. It was a bad scene, tons of my things were submerged, and the water damage was extensive. Somehow it had risen to almost two feet high. I had to do something. I didn't expect much from this place, but this was a severe enough situation that the crotchety old bastard Mr. Jacobs was going to have to fix something whether he liked it or not, or they would be getting a lawsuit in short order. I figured some lawyers would take easy cases they knew they would win with no retainer needed if they got paid more at the end. So, it would not be a bluff, I was dead serious. I almost drowned in my own apartment. I staggered to the door and managed to open it, draining tons of water out into the hall. But I didn't care, I just needed some fresh air. My back was on fire, but nothing would stop me. I heard a voice calling out to me, it was Maxine. Hey, are you okay? I saw all the water and hadn't seen you around. Is there flooding there? She asked with an odd look, almost like she knew the answer but didn't want to let on. Yes, there is. It is pretty bad, actually. I was just about to call Mr. Jacobs to do something about it. Greg, she paused for a moment then continued. You didn't see anything in there, did you? In the water, like something or someone familiar. I was confused by the specific nature of the question. I was put off and unsure how she knew I might have seen something. I am not sure what I saw. Why do you ask? I responded. No reason. Just be careful. It can be dangerous if you do. Don't worry if it is not where you belong. You won't get pulled in forever. Just be careful though. You don't want to risk it. A flash of morbid glee was evident on her face for a split second and then it was gone. I was starting to feel uncomfortable. Pulled in. How do you know about the leak? And if you do what's behind it? I ask with mounting suspicion evident in my voice. You know, Greg, in many cultures the path between the world of the living and the dead is separated by only the slightest barrier, often a literal or symbolic body of water. Whether the river sticks, the lake of fire, the waters reflected at the feet of a Tory gate, it is often just potent waters. Like all bodies of water, when they are contained somewhere there can be leaks. Sometimes the water is not the only thing that seeps out. She stopped speaking for a moment and fixed me with an intense stare that made me feel very strange. I did not know what she was talking about. Was she saying that portal leads to some sort of afterlife, like heaven or more likely in this case, hell? Did you just say? And she cut me off, saying, Oh, if Mr. Jacobs finally goes over there to fix your ceiling, let him know I had a concern I needed to express to him as well. It's been waiting for a long time. She smiled again in a creepy way that disturbed me. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. I guess I can do that. Thanks. See you later and hope you feel better. Those accidents can be rough. Best not sleep on your side and to drink lots of water. The right kind though. She winked at me and departed, and I was at a loss for what just happened. How did she know I had gotten hurt I didn't tell her? And what was that thing about the right kind of water? My anxiety about the situation was increasing, and I was disturbed by Maxine's questions too. Maybe she was not so sweet and trustworthy after all. After far too long being ignored and dealing with the first sodden, now moldering cloths, boxes, and other personal effects, Mr. Jacobs finally scheduled a time to drain the last remnants of water and do something more concrete about fixing the leak. I was waiting patiently for his arrival and there was a loud banging at the door. I greeted Mr. Jacobs and he grunted at me and without looking at me walked past and looked up at the hole in the ceiling. He had an odd air of what almost looked like fear or concern on his face. After he walked in another larger person in coveralls and holding a toolbox did as well. There was a large tarp or something that seemed odd to bring to this sort of job. It almost looked like a big sort of bag. They were both looking at the hole in the ceiling and Mr. Jacobs turned on a dime and stared me down. It's just been water leaking down, nothing else right. 
I thought the question was odd and I hesitated to answer since I was thinking of those vivid nightmares. I think he may have noticed that because his face sank and he glowered at me looking significantly angrier and more dangerous than before. Before I could answer, he shouted at me. What did you see? Did something come out of the hole? Was it a person? He looked manic and deranged, and I looked at the other man in the coveralls and he stood silent holding a sledgehammer that had appeared in his hand and watching the confrontation unfold. I... I don't know I just saw the leak. What is going on? What do you think I saw? My neighbor asked me the same thing earlier. Mr. Jacob's eyes narrowed. What neighbor? I haven't had tenants in 315 or 317 in over a year. I was confused. Maybe I had heard Maxine's apartment number wrong, but how could she be my neighbor if she was not in one of those? This must be some kind of mix-up, I figured. My neighbor Maxine, she said she lives in 315. I just saw her the other day and she asked if I had seen something as well. At the mention of the name, Mr. Jacob's face turned white. You said her name was Maxine. She said that. You saw her. He was screaming at me asking more questions about Maxine like she was on America's Most Wanted. What does she have to do with this? I don't know what the hell is going on. I admitted. Ignoring my question, Mr. Jacobs began pacing and holding his hand to his head. The man in coveralls spoke for the first time. Jack, we have to go. Let's find the body while the leak and portal are still here and dispose of the loose end. I gasped at the admission of both a body and that I was apparently a loose end to some sort of crime. I fucking know. Alright, make it quick. We are going to have to do too, so let's go before more people start coming home and we risk someone hearing. I fell back against the wall in shock as the large man hefted the sledgehammer and started stomping toward me. I was unarmed and injured. I didn't know what I could do, but suddenly the lights went out again. The door slammed shut, and as the three of us stood there in stunned silence, a slow drip began to trickle from the ceiling, each drop splashing off of the low-standing pool of water. The large man went to the door and tried to open it but to no avail. Jack, what is going on? The man shouted to Mr. Jacobs. I don't know, just use the hammer, kill him, and then bust us out of here, or just give it to me and I will fucking do it. They were going to kill me. I had to think of something quick, so I stammered out. Wait, I don't know what is going on you guys. You don't want to kill me. I really don't know anything. Let's just get out of here before the water gets much worse. I think something bad is going to happen. As if on cue the dripping stopped and a torrent of water was disgorged from the hole in the ceiling, which now held a horribly familiar glow and was pouring a blood red liquid into the apartment. There was a giggle followed by a blood curdling screech and the man in the coveralls with the hammer was wrenched up off his feet and dragged kicking and screaming into the water. Mr. Jacobs and I both watched as his entire head was forced under the water by some unseen force. The man was being drowned and as he looked like he might kick up a splash of water, landed next to him, revealing a brief outline of a female form. The eyes were white and it had a horrible smile on its face. Its unnaturally long hand was wrapped fully around the man's throat and was effortlessly throttling him. Mr. Jacobs saw something, or someone he recognized in the violent mist, and started sobbing and begging for mercy. I didn't mean to, please. It was an accident. I would have been locked up. I couldn't lose everything. I had to. I sat in stark terror as the falling water from the ceiling became a storm. The millions of droplets highlighted the attacker. Her form was terrible yet oddly mesmerizing. She strolled along towards Mr. Jacobs who was grasping at the door handle and tugging uselessly at it. He reached for the hammer when he was pulled toward the figure by a moving tendril of bloody water. Just a little bath, Jack. That's all it won't hurt. Much. He tried to scream, but his head was submerged in the bloody water. I saw the sentient waves of ruinous liquid grasp each of his appendages and tear him limb from limb in a bloody explosion. I screamed and stumbled away wading through the water into my bedroom and desperately pulled on the window to escape that way. I heard splashing footsteps and a soft pretty tune being sung by an ethereal voice. Then I heard a giant crash and saw a portion of wall collapse along with more of the ceiling and the sight before my eyes almost drove me insane. 
there was a vortex of bloody water sucking the maimed bodies of those men into the hellish portal where the leak originated, and at the center was the bloody figure smiling at me and waving a hand as I finally got the window to budge and fall out. I stepped outside and tried to descend the fire escape, but the surface was too slippery, and I fell. I screamed and plummeted down and thought I would land on my head and die. Yet as I fell, my descent slowed into my shock and horror. I realized the rainwater was mixing with the water from my apartment flowing out of the window, and I was being pulled back up into my room. I tried to scream but I felt water fill my mouth. At some point in the nightmare ride I blacked out again. That was the last thing I remembered before I found myself here again. As I listened to the leak once more, I wonder if it could have all been a bad dream. The water, the leak, the portal. It is all too much. It couldn't have been real. I will go into my dingy living room and see the water dripping into the bowl and realize it was all just a terrible dream. Yet when I sit up, I notice an odd breeze and when my eyes focus in the dark, I see lights in the sky. The sky. The ceiling is gone. I don't know what is going on here, but I know I have to get out of here now. I hear splashing footsteps again over the ever-present dripping, and see in the sky now the light of the monstrous portal opening in the very clouds above. It is too much I leap from the fire escape again. Somehow in my mad haste, I survived ascending the fire escape and I sit here now writing this impossible story in my car that I have been living in nearly a week after the fact. I heard on the news the reports of a structural collapse at my apartment, and the landlord being unavailable for questioning, presumed missing along with another man who worked at the apartment as a special contractor. I thought about Mr. Jacobs and the man in the coveralls and shuddered when I remembered them being drawn into that unholy portal in the ceiling. Apparently, it had not been the only disappearance in the building either. Around a year ago, there was a missing persons report for a Maxine Valoroso. I remember how Mr. Jacobs reacted to her name, and it made me wonder what really happened here before I moved in. I don't know who or what Maxine was, maybe she was the same person in the report, changed somehow. Best I can guess Mr. Jacobs had known something about her disappearance. Maybe he had killed her and somehow, she came back for revenge. She mentioned the water washing away people's violent lives and I shuddered when I considered her smile when talking about the last person in 316 and the overdue message she had to send to Mr. Jacobs. I didn't know if she was a ghost, a demon or what. I also don't know the extent of her reach or if she is satisfied with just those men and who knows how many others she had washed away from that room with that dread portal. I suppose it doesn't matter to me anymore, I am never going back there. I gave all my belongings up for lost, and the building was condemned anyway after the landlord disappeared and the ceiling collapsed in several sections of the building. I think there are terrible things they will discover if they ever really investigate the building. Perhaps they will find bodies, perhaps the bodies are all gone, sucked into that watery abyss, that eldritch gate to hell whose opening started with a simple leak. If something like that can happen, I just don't know. I don't know if anyone is safe anymore. 